Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This morning we're looking at Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and it's the beginning of a series that I've had mulling over in the back of my mind for quite some time, and never really fully uh, was aware of when this should actually be done. But I said, it has to be done now. And to be honest with you, I don't know why. All I know is that in the study this past week, I sense a, a real presence, a very tangible presence of God by the Spirit just telling me, now is the time. And one of the things that God was saying to me was to Corinth with love. To Corinth with love. Now I hadn't thought about that particular phrase in many, many a long year. Because it was back probably in the, in the 1980s that I read a book to Corinth with love. And it was all about what took place in the church in Corinth. About how God's love can deal with all the difficulties and the hassles and the problems and the pressures of being a believer in a non-believing world. I sensed again there were so many lessons to be learned from Paul's letter to the Corinthians because it is so apt for our world today. We live in a very different world in one sense from what the world was like that Paul lived in. I mean, in that space of time, there are huge leaps in technology, huge leaps in all the world around us, and the things that happen in communication and travel and all the rest of it. It is light years away in that sense. But where it is very apt and where it is appropriate is the fact that Paul speaks into the lives of believers and let's, not remind, let's remind ourselves, let's not forget that as Paul writes this letter, he does so to the believers. He writes to the believers, those who are young in faith, wrestling with being a believer in a world. And in a very alien world from faith. He's speaking into the lives of them. And likewise, because of the natural humanity that is revealed there. And the human traits that are there. And all the temptations that are there. And all the feelings and sinfulness that are there. We realize afresh that there is very little has changed in the hearts and the minds of men and women down through the years. In other words, similar situations that the Corinthian church face, we face today. Similar pressures and temptations that the Corinthian church face, we face today. That is the reality of where we're at. That is the reality of how God moves through his word and translates the word that was written so many years ago into the world of today so that we can live through Christ in this world and bring honour and bring glory to him. So let's begin to seek to find and savour some of the things that God wants to say to us today. What we're going to do this morning is basically an overview, an overview of the church in Corinth. And we're going to talk, call it the life in the church at Corinth. Life in the church at Corinth. And as we do that, we're going to find the realities of some of the things that God has in his word for us this morning. It tells us in a quote, and I'm not sure who was it, Quoted, but it says the authority of the Bible comes not because of its human authors, 
but rather from the character of the divine author. So what we do is we begin first of all with God. And look at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Now when you consider that particular verse, Paul begins always, always with Jesus and with God. He always begins, first and foremost, to set the scene right. God first, Christ, his Son, our Saviour, is revealed in the reality of who Paul is. Paul is only an apostle, a leader of the church, because of what Christ Jesus had done on the cross at Calvary, died, buried, rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father. Because of what Christ had done, Paul was able to be an apostle of Christ because of that wonderful encounter that he had on the Damascus Road. God burst into his life in a most powerful manner. And there are very few people who have probably had a similar conversion experience, for the want of a better word, a, an experience of God in such a powerful manner. But Paul experienced that, and everything that he was, everything that he said, everything that he did, he set the scene by God first, and himself second. And his calling in God was always acknowledged, his authority was always acknowledged as being from and given from God. And so Paul begins with his letter to the Corinthian church. And it's an early church of the ancient world that is set in a very ancient culture. And it had very ancient values. It had very real pressures. And you may ask, what is that to say to us today. Well, I think the culture at Corinth is probably a culture that as we study God's Word together over the next two or three months, it's a culture that we will be very, very familiar with. You know, today's world and today's ways would settle in very well in Corinth. And perhaps some of the things that were taking place in Corinth have actually translated very well into the world in which we live today. But what we can learn from God's Word is that if we are prepared to be God first, and give God His rightful place first, and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, and live in the power of the Spirit, we can learn that we can be victorious in a world that does not want to recognize the authority of the church and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we look at the Corinthian church and the place at Corinth. We realize that they were a church that were living in a multi-ethnic, multi-faith, anything goes society. That sets the scene. That gives you the picture. And Michael Green describes Paul's letter to the Corinthians as the vital relevance today of Paul's advice to the Corinthian church. He describes it as the vital relevance today of Paul's advice to the Corinthian church. And here you are, set the scene this morning. Here is the Southern Paul, the Gulf here and the Gulf of Corinth on the other side, small peninsula of land, and, well, there's the Corinth Canal that's there today, wasn't there in Paul's day, probably uh, a very, very central part of the ancient world as it was back then. What would take place is that they would sail up the one Gulf, the Gulf of Corinth, they would then, if it were small boats, they would actually have special rollers and umpteen labourers, and they would actually drag the boats all the way across that peninsula, all the way across this neck of land, and in to the Southern Gulf here. If it were larger boats, they would come in, they would get offloaded into cars, and then they would take 
all the goods over and then load them onto another boat on the other side. It was a central pivotal place for commerce. And so, so Corinth was a very, very important commercial centre. <coughs> and the Corinthian church was founded some 20 years after the ascension of Christ. It was a dynamic, growing, but chaotic church. A bit like ourselves. How often have we been growing? And how often have we been dynamic? And how often have we been chaotic? Well, nothing changes. That was the Corinthian church. And perhaps there are some lessons there for us to learn within the church at Corinth. But Paul loved this church. Paul loved this church. And he loved it with such a passion. You only need to read one of the two Corinthians. You read it and you see the passion of love that he has for this church. But also you read within it that he is so exasperated with it. Such is Paul the church planter and Paul the pastor. He just gets exasperated when folks walk away from the law or do things that are contrary to God's word. The foundation of the church comes to us in Acts chapter 18. And if you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 18, it's a, a, a long passage of scripture, we'll read part of it, but we will be referring to it on and off over the next while. Acts chapter 18 verse 1, after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth and he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and because he was a tent maker there, he went and stayed and worked with them and every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. And when Paul, Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then Paul left the synagogue, went next door to the house of uh, Titus Justus, a worshipper of God, Christmas, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard them believed and were baptized. And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one's going to attack you or harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God, while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him to court. This man they charged is persuading the people of, to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involved questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So they had them ejected from the court. And they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern, whatever. And Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. And then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And before he sailed, he had his hair cut off in Sincrea because of a vow that he had taken. And they arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Well, long passage of scripture, but it sets the scene. You can see Paul the church planter. He goes and he speaks out the word of God. Even though there are folks opposing him, he speaks out. And sometimes in our world today, one of the lessons that we have to learn is to speak out with a boldness, with a holy boldness, to speak out the word of God in season and out of season. And the fact is, as we said the scene this morning, that comes through very, very clear to us. How can people hear about God unless they are told? 
without God. Unless God's people speak the words from their lips and live the one way of faith in their life, how can people come to that place? Paul spoke boldly and folks came to God. Folks came to Christ through that. But it was in the midst of folks not liking it. And we see Paul, the church planter at work. And he preached to those who reject. And as they reject, he respects their decision. And he moves on to those who will hear. And when he preaches to those who did hear and were prepared to hear, they were saved. And so the prompting of God results in being in the right place at the right time with the right people, with the right folk being added to the church. And the world of Corinth was a heavily controlled one. And we see that with the proconsul and so on in Acts chapter 18. It was a Roman colony rebuilt in 46 BC after it had been laid bare for some 100 years. The proconsul of Achaia made it his capital city in 27 BC and it was Latin speaking. That was the official language that was recognized for commerce in that place. It was a crucial port, as we've seen already, situated on that narrow neck of land. And a large number of Jews mixed with a large number of Greek philosophers, mixed with a large group of multi-ethnic traders. And they made it a very wealthy place to be. But within a whole mixture of moral norms, mixed with a religious variety that would pale into insignificance today, the worship of Aphrodite, Astarte, Isis, Osiris, including cult prostitution, Jewish worship, a whole raft of other religions all mixed together, it was a melting pot. That was Corinth. It was a mixed community. But it was also a community dedicated to pleasure. Greedy for power. Fascinated by rhetoric. And obsessed by knowledge. Well, it's easy to see in the light of all that why Paul was called to be in the right place at the right time to be God's man to plant a church. All his gifts that he had were being used. God had gifted him. And in his gifts being used, he plants a church that was that vibrant, thriving, albeit chaotic church. And perhaps there's a message there for us this morning of our, the importance of our being in the right place at the right time, using our gifts in the right manner to glorify God and to build the church. And we'll see that when we come to some of the later chapters in 1 Corinthians. And when Paul stays about 18 months there, he begins a work that others are to continue on. See, God moves in mysterious ways to lead Apollos to him. And he was built up by Priscilla and Aquila. And of course, he had moved by that time, they had moved by that time to Ephesus. And then had come on to Corinth and they made a big impression in the church. Later on in 56, 57 AD in Corinth, Paul wrote his letter to the Romans. And so it begins to go on. You begin to get a picture and a feel for this particular letter. It's not just a, a letter of words stuck in a, a, a book or a library of books. It's not just that. This is a very personal letter in a personal account of someone called by God to share God in all his fullness with others. And Paul had a, a real burden for Corinth. And you see some of the ruins in Corinth there. And uh, some of the church leaders who were at a conference with me yesterday, they'll see some of these, um, these particular pictures. You saw them yesterday. I think the chap used to see websites. I did to download them. But when you come to the Paul's burden for Corinth, there's a lesson here for us. I wonder really 
how much of a burden we have for the folks around us. You've heard me talk about this and preach about this on numerous occasions. And I've even had comments made, Why, when are you going to stop preaching this week? And I'm saying, well, when we take it seriously. When we really take it seriously. And when the burden is burning in our hearts for those around us. And perhaps we need to learn from Paul and from this particular letter about the burden that he had for the folks in Cotton. He had such a passion to lead others to that place of faith because he realized the experience that he had had of God's forgiveness and God's compassion and God's love was the only hope that these folks had. And if he did not share that and have a burden for that, then they would go to a lost eternity. And so there's a lesson there for us all these years down the line from Paul, the church planter at Corinth. And he's calling from God a, a burden revealed to Paul by the Spirit. A message there for us this morning as well. Are we sensitive enough are we open enough to be prompted by God's Holy Spirit? Turn with me to Acts 19. Acts 19 and verses 8 to 11. And when we consider that Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, some of them became obstinate and refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. They went on from there, sorry, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Paul was called by God. You see the burden that he has there when it comes to Ephesus. That same burden that he had was also there in Corinth. And it's amazing how God moves in mysterious ways. Paul reveals his calling by the Spirit. He is spiritually in tune. He's spiritually sensitive to the leading of God. Paul persuasively speaks in the Spirit. And folks are obstinate. You see that in both accounts, in Acts and in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. You see the obstinacy of folks. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear this God thing. And so that is part of parcel of being a witness and a testimony to God. There will be folks who will get really annoyed and angry with us when we talk about God. That's part of the cross that we bear as believers. But as we do that speaking and that sharing, there will also be folks who will hear, and as they hear, and as they grasp hold of what we're saying, they then find a reality in Christ that we ourselves have found. And in that reality, they come to faith. And you can see that as Paul shares and ministers the word of the Lord. From AD to 53, AD 53 to 56, Paul hears of the immorality in Corinth. And he writes to the church and he urges them to steer clear of the world's influence at all costs. If you look at 1 Corinthians 5 and, and verse 9, it reminds us of that. It tells us, I have written to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. I mean, that's just one area. One area that he writes to them about. He's aware of the world's influences. He's aware that they need to be protected and stand for Christ and walk the way of Christ. A little later, Paul hears of further troubles and receives a letter asking for advice. You'll need to look at 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1 to find that one. Now for the matters 
you roll about. It is good for a man not to marry. That's just waking your appetites, gentlemen. But we'll come back to that one. Things that they wrote to Paul about needing advice, help. And sometimes we find ourselves in that position in the world in which we live today. How often have we come to the Lord and shouted, help, Lord. I don't know what to do. I do that every day. We come across situations that, humanly speaking, we have absolutely no idea what to do about it. And we have to cast ourselves upon the Lord, as Paul did. You see the building up of the picture in the background? You see the burden that he has for Corinth, the burden that he has for people? And so Paul writes from Ephesus to Corinth, before Pentecost. And uh, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16 and, and verse 8, you find that to be the case. Paul writes, but I will stay on in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work is open to me, and there are so many, uh, sorry, and there are many who oppose me. He writes from Ephesus to Corinth because of the burden that he has for the folks there. It's owing to difficulties, Acts 19 and 22. He, that is Paul, sent Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, For this reason I am sending Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with, with what I teach everywhere and in every church. 1 Corinthians 16 and 10, If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he's carrying out the work of the Lord just as I am. There was Opposition, a group of opposition there. They wanted the church to go in one direction, and there were a whole group of other folks who said, No, we want to go the way the Lord wants us to go. And so there were tensions. And Paul was quite concerned, because Timothy is quite timid. A timid and gentle character. He's saying, Don't dare snugger. <coughs> Is it any different from the church of today? Is it any different from the church that we know? Well, Paul had a burden for the church in Corinth, and the bad news seems to have forced his hand, and so he visits Corinth after sending his first letter, and it must have been quite a horrible experience for him, because he can only allude to it. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, you begin to see that. And if you think the, the Christian life is an easy option, then think again. When we have a burden for others and when we seek to do the will of the Lord, then there are major difficulties and problems. There's chapter 2 in 2 Corinthians, so I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. Well, there is nothing new under the sun when you set the scene in the church. And uh, when God moves in mysterious ways, well, sometimes God's people get burned. They get hurt. In chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians, and verse 1 says, This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so it goes on. We're going to be looking at a lot of these things as we consider the reality. Some writers have said that Paul appears to have sailed right back to Ephesus, having been rebuffed by a strong-willed-minded faction in the church in Corinth. Well, Paul still had a burden for them, and he went back for more. He hung on in there. He hung on in there. And you know, I have to say that as I was looking and studying this week and writing up the notes for this morning, I was so, so aware of the faithfulness of folks in Inverkeith Baptist Church. And for our first six years, as you know, I mean, there was just non-stop conflict. 
non-stop conflict and folks at one another, at one another, at one another. But it made you so aware of the importance of hanging on in there. Hanging on in there, even sometimes just by the fingertips, even by the fingernails, you know how painful that is. You're hanging on in there. Saying, Lord, I'm just hanging in with you. I don't know what to do, but I'm hanging in there with you. And I was so conscious of you, just hanging on in there throughout that time. And we're now at a time where there is a joy to come to worship. It's a blessing to come to worship. There's a sense of harmony and a sense of fellowship there, a bonding together. And now is the time because God said, I recognize that you've hung on in there. Now is the time for blessing. Now is the time for going forward. Now is the time for me to release my hand. You're ready. And I'm preparing you. To receive. That's what I said it's got been saying this week. And that's exactly how Paul felt. He hung on in there. He didn't give up on them. He didn't run away to the next place. He moved on at the prompting of God, granted. But as he was, as we saw when he wrote the letter from Ephesus, they were not far away from his mind. He was constantly thinking about it, constantly praying about it, constantly wondering how he was going to phrase and write what he was going to do. The advice that he was going to give. He was seeking the Lord all the time. And that is where we are as a fellowship. And that's why God has lessons for us to learn from Paul's letter to the Corinthians this morning. So what sort of issues do these preachers face or fall foul of? A congregation's run. Well, the reality is Paul never shied away from difficult subjects. There's one of the temples, or the ruins of one of the temples. It was said at night there were hundreds of temple prostitutes went and plied their wares in the seaport of Corinth. It was said that if you wanted to insult somebody, really insult them, you call them a Corinthicizer. You would say to go and Corinthicize. And that was one of the biggest insults that you could give to somebody because of the immorality, because of the waywardness of the people like Corinth. It wasn't a place, it wasn't a nice place to be as a believer. And probably for some believers, if we transpose that to today's situation, we would say the same thing about the world in which we live. And the believers would immediately come into the building and lock the door and have a lovely wee time together, then unlock the door and go back out, run back home and lock the door again and try and not allow the world to taint us. But that's not how Paul worked. Paul didn't lock the church away. He wrote to them to prepare them to live in that, in that world and live in that environment as believers and not be pressured and not be caught up and live life the same as those around them. We have lessons to learn from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And some of the difficult areas, the difficult subjects that were raised were difficult subjects because folks came in from the world and brought all their baggage with them. There were temple prostitutes who had a horrendous life, a horrendous background, things that God needed to heal in their life. They came into the church. There were corrupt businessmen who came to Christ and came into the church. There were folks who were in totally abhorrent relationships as far as God was concerned. They came into the church and all that baggage came with them. And they had to be shown gently in the Lord ways in which to live that would honour Christ. They had to repent, believe, but be baptized and then live Christ and no longer live in the same manner 
that they lived once before. But there was hard work involved. There was discipleship involved. There was preaching involved. There was teaching involved. Everything else that the believers who were strong in the faith had to do to an order that these folks could grow. There's lessons for us to learn from Paul's letter to the Corinthians so that we are prepared to prepare others to live for Christ in the world in which we live today. So what sort of things did he fall foul of? Challenging them about. Well, he fell foul of the congregation because he dared challenge some of the things that were being said and done. In church life, there were issues. Folks' interpretation. He challenged them about baptism. Well, that's a live issue. And it'll be very interesting for us at Keswick this year, won't it? It'll be very interesting because as Grace is baptised down in Keswick, there's going to be a lot of folks here who have different viewpoints on baptism. But we will go ahead and we'll baptise and we'll be a witness and testimony to the Lord. And, well, folks don't like it. So be it, that's fine, you know, big enough for us. <coughs> but the fact is, Paul was challenged about the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. The Eucharistio, <coughs> the giving thanks, feast, the breaking of bread, the taking of bread and wine in remembrance of Christ. Paul challenged their viewpoints on that. For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, etc., etc. And he has to bring them back and say, you know, stop the stop and all this. You're getting it wrong. We need to show you the right way, teach you the right way. He talked to them about church body life. He talked to them about the intellect and how they viewed the intellect. Some thought, intellect, oh yes, I've got good head knowledge here, but I can go and do as a life. Do what I want to do, living in the world. It doesn't matter as long as I believe I'm here. You have to challenge that. He talked to him about freedom, about slavery, about giving, about suffering, about death, about immorality. He even talked about sex. Think of it. Don't talk about it, church. But you know, we live in a sex obsessed society. Absolutely obsessed. But the reality is, it's God's gift to men and women. And the world in which we live today has abused that gift. And we'll see what God has to say about that. There was problems with leadership in the church. There was a problem about the place of women in the church. There was a problem about apostolic authority. And that's just some of the topics that we'll be looking at in this particular book. It's a book full of issues that have divided believers over the years and down through the ages. There's so much more that we will look at as we share together in the weeks of lie ahead. It's going to be a pilgrimage, it's going to be a journey for us to go on together. But the one thing that I firmly believe passionately about is that the Word of God stands firm and will be translated as we faithfully come to study it together, translated into our lives, and it will come, be pressed down, shaken together, flowing over. And in that flowing over, as God's prepared people, we will see the reality of God's love being <coughs> manifest in the days. Well, our time's gone this morning. But the picture that Paul gives to us in Corinthians, well, he picks up. He picks up the reality that Christ bears our burdens and carries them for us. Remember that great hymn, Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Paul has that hope. My prayer is that we have that hope also today.
And today, as we look at this particular church in Corinth, and we've just had a, a slight, a very skim over the top overview, it whets our appetite. And let us be prepared to hunger and thirst after God. And in Christ Jesus, find his love and peace made real for us. Can I encourage you in these days to read Paul's letter to the Corinthians? Not only will it prepare you as we come to study God's Word together, it will keep us all in tune together with what I believe God's actually saying to us in these days. As we go on this journey together, let us put our hand into the hand of the one who is the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, in these days we realise that we have very few answers to give to many of the world's issues. Save but that we come to your word and savour the instruction and savour the truth that is within that. And so, Father, as we come to your word, let the word come to us. Let that truth come to us. And grant that that truth would set us free so that we might in turn go forth and set others free. So teach us eternal things. Teach us in our hearts and our minds. Because we stand on your word, O oh Father, that reminds us if the sun sets us free, we will be free indeed. Amen.